Okay, so with that, then let's move into our topic. We're going to talk about spirit of prophecy today. Um, I'm going to go about it in a little bit of a roundabout way, but I believe um, if you follow along with me, you'll see that we can only come to some certain conclusions if we if we ask certain questions. Uh, many times we don't ask the right questions, and therefore we don't get the right answers. But when we ask the right questions, the answers become obvious. And so I'm going to pray again before I open the word, and then we'll um, we'll get into this. So. Father, again, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I just ask for your mercy and your grace to speak to my brother in Norway. Jesus, I just ask that you just use me as your vessel. I thank you so much for your love and mercy to us that you gave yourself. And I thank you that as we boldly approach the throne of grace to find help and time of need on this Sabbath day, that you have promised it to us. And I pray all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So... <clears throat> In Proverbs, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the question I would ask is, what is worse, to say there is no God or to believe a false God? Would it be worse to say there is no God or to believe in a false God? I would say it's worse to believe in a false god because you cannot help someone who believes in a false god. Why can't you help them? Because they believe they're right. And when someone believes they're right, then you really can't help them. So it would be better to be foolish and believe in no god than to think you're wise and believe in a false god. And Jesus told us that in the last days there were going to be false prophets and there will be false messiahs or false gods. So in these last days, people say they believe they are serving the God of the Bible, but they really are not. Is that not true? We know this, or we wouldn't be here today. We have come away from the church of Seventh-day Adventism, not willingly per se, but unwillingly because they have decided that they want to worship a false god. Now, the Bible tells us that in the last days there's going to be confusion. We know that from Revelation chapter 18. Let's go there very quickly. In Revelation 18, it tells us, Revelation 18, verse 2, it says, And he cried with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every hateful, and unclean bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Now, Babylon represents confusion. And the confusion that the world is involved in God is saying, you have to come out. Now, if God wants us to come out of this confusion, he would have a place for us to go. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Amen? He's not going to ask you to leave something without providing somewhere else to go. But this is a worldwide problem. And to heal from this problem, we all have to leave the confusion that we have been involved in with Babylon. That's the only choice we have. If God says come out, you have to leave. So what does someone do typically when they begin to be awakened to this confusion or uh, understanding starts to come to them that there is confusion? doesn't matter if you're a Baptist, a Methodist, even a corporate Seventh-day Adventist. When confusion is being exposed, what do most people do? They go straight to their pastor. And they ask their pastor. Now, what does their pastor do? Does their pastor help them? Or does their pastor seek to solidify them in the confusion that they're involved in? Well, <laughs> if you ask your pastor even about the father-son message, I'm sure that you did not get an answer in the affirmative that following that was the truth. You would have been told, I know that when I first heard these things, the pastor of the fellowship that I was in said, well, these people come to cause 
confusion come to call strife when really they were the ones that were the pastor, the people I was fellowshipping with, were the ones that were in confusion and that were in strife. And the Lord was sending someone there to help me, but the pastor tried to turn me out of the way. Well, by God's grace, that didn't happen. I'm here today. So, but anyway, to deny this reality really is to reject the authority of God. And so we have to keep that in mind. Now, I want to go to Revelation 14. Revelation, excuse me, Revelation 16. We want to look in verse 12. Please stay with me. You're going to see where I'm going here. In Revelation 16, verse 12, we read, it says here, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And he says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So there's unclean spirits that are coming out of the mouth of these three frogs. And these three frogs are the beast, I mean the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So they're saying something. It says in verse 14, For they are the spirits of devil, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So these unclean spirits, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, they are saying things to gather people together for a battle, a battle called Armageddon. Now, with, where in the Bible are we told about frogs? If you think about it, in the book of Exodus, as it deals with the children of Israel leaving Egypt, they were, one of the plagues was frogs. There were frogs everywhere. If you read the plague of the frogs, there were frogs they Everywhere they looked, there were frogs, frogs in baskets, frogs in their bedroom, frogs in their bed, frogs all over the place. And then ultimately, when the plague of the frogs ceased, they died and they stank up the whole land, and they had to clean them up. And so there's some typology here with this idea of frogs, or these three unclean spirits like frogs. The doctrines and the lies that they are teaching are going to be everywhere, and they stink the land. They stink the whole world with their false doctrine. So, who are these frogs? The dragon, beast, and false prophet. Well, many people would say the dragon is the devil. But in true keeping with figures, the figure of a dragon is paganism. So we have paganism. The beast figure we know is the papacy. And the false prophet figure we know is apostate Protestantism. So the three frogs, or the three messages that are going to the whole world to confuse them are messages out of paganism, messages out of the papacy, and messages out of apostate Protestantism. And they are going ultimately against what? They're going against the law of God. Most professed Christians would say that they belong to Jesus, and they are a part of either the beast or apostate Protestantism, because paganism is paganism. I live in an area where there's lots of paganism, and that could identify itself as people that are into yoga, they're Hindu in their nature, or people into Buddha, or whatever that may be, or just atheism. All these would fall into the categories of paganism. But when we deal with those that are professed believers, they are making the law of God of none effect. How do I know that? How do you know that? Well, just ask them about the Sabbath commandment. Ask them if the fourth commandment is binding. It doesn't matter what argument they present. The one universal argument that you will hear, especially among apostate Protestantism, is the law has been done away with. So all three agree that there is no Sabbath, no true Sabbath, seven-day Sabbath for modern man, and they're making the law of God of no effect. So how did Protestantism become apostate? What happened? Well, we have to go back to the time of Jesus and see why the church rejected their Messiah. Because these things are circular. You must understand this. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, there is nothing new under the sun. That which is past is that which shall be. And so the lessons that we can go back and learn from 2,000 years ago are lessons that we need to understand today. 
Now, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, let's turn there. Mark 1, verse 14, we read, Now after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus comes and he's preaching a time. He says the time is fulfilled and the time is at hand. What was Jesus referring to? Now, if you have a marginal reference Bible, and it's a good marginal reference Bible, I have one, where it has references in the margin, you look at verse 15 there of Mark chapter 1, and you're going to see Daniel 9.25. Now, what is Daniel 9.25? Let's go there. Because this is what Jesus was referring to. In the book of Daniel, as he's declaring time, He's referring to Daniel 9.25 because he understood the time. The wise men also understood time. That's why they came looking for him. And guess what? We're a people that are supposed to understand time. So you should understand that the devil is going to do everything he can to confuse time. Why is he going to do that? Because he wants you to be late. He wants you to, be, he wants you to think you're on time when you're not on time. And he's going to confuse time so much that eventually people will push time so far out that there will then be no time because the time will come. That's the danger of people that set time, and it's not in accordance with how the scriptures have said that we should set time. But in verse 25 it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the streets shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. For the overspreading of the abomination he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation of that determined shall be poured out, or shall be poured upon the desolate. Jesus is referring to the 70 weeks of Daniel as the time that was fulfilled. Now, the Jews rejected Jesus over a misunderstanding of the book of Daniel. You see, they saw there in verse 26, shall Messiah be cut off. But in their theology, their Messiah would not be cut off, right? Jesus told the disciples over and over again that he must go and he must be crucified, and they refused to believe it. Why did they refuse to believe it? Because that's not what the religious leaders were telling them in their time. They were telling them that their Messiah was going to come, and he was going to come as a conquering king, he was going to put down the Romans, and ultimately there was going to be this millennium of peace that would come, or you know, however they taught. But they did not teach their Messiah would be cut off, and Jesus did. The thing you need to understand is what caused the disciples and all of those that professed to be looking for their Messiah in their day was a misunderstanding over the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Are we not seeing the same things today, brothers and sisters? Misunderstandings over the book of Daniel. It's happening even right now among us. And it's going to cause people to miss their Messiah. But I digress. Now, the Apostle Paul, he understood the time. And he applied it correctly after his conversion. And he declared and preached Jesus that the time had been fulfilled in his coming as Messiah. And you know or have to know that the Apostle Paul would have taught Daniel because when he speaks to the Thessalonians, he says, know and understand that that day will not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. And the only way he would have known who the man of sin could be and who needed to be revealed was going to the book of Daniel. So now Protestants today do something very interesting with this time. They misapply the 70th week of Daniel. They take that last week of Daniel and they do something. They put it into the future. It's called futurism. And it was conceived by the Jesuits. It comes out of the papacy. They used it to counter the Protestant Reformation. 
And so once again, we're seeing even among Protestantism, a misapplication of the book of Daniel, which will cause them to miss their Messiah. Evangelicals are teaching that the, uh, the one who causes the sacrifice to cease, as we see in verse 27 of Daniel 9, that that is the Antichrist. Why are they doing that? Well, because they believe that in the future there will have to be a temple again, and there will have to be sacrifices. And we're seeing that kind of rhetoric even now. They built a whole system of lies around this. The Jews did the same. The Jews were cut off, and if the evangelicals or those that side with these kinds of ideas continue with them, they're going to be cut off too. You see, the third frog is the false prophet. Now, this begins to get us towards where we're going when we're talking about the spirit of prophecy. You see, we're dealing with a false prophet. So if we are going to have a false prophet, which is apostate Protestantism, and we also have the beast, the papacy, and the dragon, paganism, then we have to know that there's going to be true prophets or a true prophet. And that's what we're talking about today. But the thing about it is, is with the false prophet, what does it say that it will do? Well, God says that it's going to bring confusion. And that that confusion is called Babylon and that we're to come out of it. Now, if we build upon a lie, if someone builds a story on a false premise, then they will have to keep building their story off a false premise. You can't start in a wrong direction and not help but keep going in that direction. The only way to stop going in a wrong direction is to turn around and go back and go in the right direction. So you build with one line, you have to keep using lies to build upon that line. And so then they say that in the future we have a 70th week that will be fulfilled. And if that 70th week has to be fulfilled according to the way the Bible has described, then there will have to be a sacrifice, there will have to be a temple, and there has to be a literal Israel. But what is literal Israel according to their understanding? Their understanding is that literal Israel is that Israel that's over there today. And they believe that that's a fulfillment of prophecy. That in the 40s, when they came back and took that land, which that's a whole other topic for another time as well, perhaps, but that was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the 40s. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't line up. And the reason why is what does Israel mean and where did it come from? Well, if we go back into the Old Testament for sake of time, I'm not going to go there. I hope you know the story about Jacob. Jacob was born Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name meant supplanter or deceiver. And that's exactly what he did to his brother to get the birthright. Of course, his mother persuaded him to do so. But his character was such that he went along with his mother's plan and he deceived his father Isaac for the birthright and his brother Esau. And he went through a whole process, but ultimately the Lord changed his name. He wrestled with the angel throughout the night, thinking that it was a messenger to destroy him when it really was Jesus, the angel of the Lord. And at the end of that conflict, he knew that he was wrestling with something greater. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And the blessing came that his name would be changed to Israel. Israel means overcomer. And Jacob had to become that by choice. He had to make it, we all have to become Israel by choice. We have to make a choice that we are going to leave who we are, what we have been, and become what the Lord Jesus Christ has appointed to make us, which is to fashion us after his glorious character, to make us like himself. So Israel is a spiritual destination. Now, how do I know this? Let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 9. And look at a few verses. Romans 9, verse 6. Romans 9, verse 6 says, Know this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, excuse me, I need to be Romans 9, pardon me, that's a good one too though. Romans 9, Romans 9, 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel 
which are of Israel. In other words, just because they were identified with Israel, it didn't mean that they were Israel. Because he goes on to say, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise, or of the promise are counted for the seed. So Israel is a spiritual destination, not because you're necessarily born. You could be born into the Seventh-day Adventist church, but that doesn't really make you a Seventh-day Adventist. You, or whatever, you could be born into a Christian family. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is a choice. And to be Israel, to be an overcomer, is a choice that has to be made. If you go with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, you see the same idea again. Philippians 3, 3. It says here, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Circumcision, you see, to be a part of their Israel, you had to be circumcised. But Paul is saying, no, that circumcision has nothing to do with the flesh. It has nothing to do with, with your body that makes you a part of Israel. It has to do with the spirit. It has to do with something that happens in your mind. A conversion has to take place. And then in Galatians, if you go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 28, we read, Galatians 4, 23, I mean, Galatians 4, 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So Israel is a spiritual thing. Now, how has all of professed Christianity missed this? Why are they not understanding this? Can Israel today, the one that was restored in the 40s, be the true Israel? It can't be, because it has to do with a spiritual thing. So what has happened is they've made a huge mistake. In Romans chapter 11, in Romans chapter 11, in verse 19, we read, Romans 11, 19, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. <clears throat> and if you continue with me to verse 23, it says, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. This is talking about the Gentile being grafted into true Israel. But you can't be grafted into this literal Israel that's over there today because that is not really God's true people. Spiritual Israel is God's true people. It has always been his true people. Um, it was the same in the Old Testament. You could identify yourself with the nation of Israel, but that didn't necessarily mean you're an overcomer. And if you go to the book of Revelation, you see consistently in the admonishment to the seven churches, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, will ultimately make up that spiritual Israel that will be in the kingdom of heaven. So we have all been plagued by frogs. That's the thing. We've been plagued by frogs, and we need to understand that. And they are stinking up the land with their false doctrine. How can they make this false application of Daniel 9 work? They can't make it work. Frogs are false prophets. And the false prophet joins the rest of the world to the other two frogs, or one way or another. They all work together to basically connect people to error. But we, as, of course, I don't know who all is on my call today. Some people may be identifying themselves still with Protestantism. They are learning these things. They're understanding or growing in their understanding. They're, by and large, I'm sure most of the people on this call have identified themselves with seven-day Adventism, at least the Sabbath. So what are we going to do in the sense that we have to know there is a truth for this time because God has countered these three frogs. How has he countered them? 
In Revelation 14, we have what's called the three angels' message. And the three angels' message, three angels that impose the three frogs or the lies of the three frogs. In Revelation 14, let's go and look at the first angel's message. In Revelation 14... Verse 6, we read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. So just as these three frogs will be all throughout the midst of the land, bring a false understanding, a false doctrine, and stinking up the land, there's also going to be an angel that will come, which are messengers, i.e. we are called to be those messengers, that are also going to go through the land. Now, we're going to have an everlasting gospel. We're going to have an everlasting truth, a truth that has always been, and we're going to give it to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people in a counter-reaction to those false prophets, those, uh, the, the, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophets, in counter to that. And we're going to be declaring that we are to fear God, it says here in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, and sea, and fountains of waters. Right in here in verse 7, we see the Father-Son message because we see judgment, and we also see creation. We know the Father in Daniel 7 sits down in judgment, and we know from Hebrews 1 and even in Colossians that Jesus Christ made the world by the mandate of the Father. We have the Father-Son here, and we're being commanded to fear and worship him. And there is no other call at the end of time. Because when we go, as we began today with Revelation 18, the call is to come out of her, my people, come out of all her confusion. It is the only answer. The only answer is to come out. Now, here's the thing. With the truth, how many truths are true? You can only have one truth. You can have many lies, but you can only have one truth. There's one absolute truth. There's only one door out of this room that I'm in right now. There's one window out of this room that I'm in right now. There's not multiple windows and multiple doors. That's the only way out. And it's the same thing with this situation. There's only one door out of air, and it's called the three angels' message. So then, as we think about all this, as we begin to wrap this up, these ideas, what I want you to think about is, in principle, who is telling the truth. Who is preaching the three angels' message? Or where is the three angels' message originating from? And if all the world is being influenced by three frogs, three frogs that one of them being a false prophet, then there would have to be a counter to that that has a true prophet. I could get into you know all the reasons why we should accept Ellen White as a prophet. I believe that the Lord would have to raise up the gift of prophecy for his people because he has declared that he would do so because he's going to have a true church. And a true church is always gifted with prophecy. Now, if you know anything about our past, in the first 50 years of our past, there were other men within the Seventh-day Adventist movement that were being moved upon by the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ, to teach truth. But there was one individual in particular, Ellen White, who had been gifted in a special measure by the Spirit of Christ, even to, like Moses, speak openly face-to-face -face with Jesus, because she has professed at times in vision that she spoke face-to-face -face with Jesus. That is something that is significant for a prophet, especially a last-day prophet. Now, you may or may not believe that. I don't know. I have settled myself in my mind that Jesus spoke directly to her and through her, and we call it the gift of prophecy. In Revelation 14, 12, it tells us, in Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So there's going to be a people that are going to do both. They're not going to be just people that profess to keep commandments. They're not going to be people that just profess the faith of Jesus. 
They're going to do both. And, of course, we know that true faith in Jesus is a belief in a literal son of a father, not this Trinitarian. This is not the faith of Jesus. To believe a Trinitarian God is not to have the faith of Jesus because Jesus declared himself as the son of God, and he declared it in faith. And they even tried to get him to deny it, and he said, I'm not a liar like unto you. I cannot lie. I have to declare who I am. I am the Son of God. And for that very reason, they crucified him. And those that are truly his people cannot lie. They cannot declare anything but that Jesus Christ is the literal Son of God, those that really belong to him. And those people that do that will also have to declare that his commandments are binding. And there's only one group of people that I know that even remotely fit the bill for that. And within that rank, there is the gift of prophecy. If you go with me to Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, we're told in verse 10, Revelation 19, verse 10, it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, that being the angel that was speaking to John. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The angel is saying to John, I testify of Christ. I testify of him in truth. And if I testify of him in truth, I have the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of truth is the spirit of prophecy. Is the spirit of prophecy in the Seventh-day Adventist movement? It is. Is it today in the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church? It's there. Are they following it? No, they're making it of none effect. And we don't want to be guilty of doing the same, brothers and sisters, of making the spirit of prophecy of none effect. To make something of none effect is not to say you don't believe it. It's to deny a part of it. When there's a plain statement that says something is a certain way, and you say, well, no, it could be this way, then you just made the spirit of prophecy of none effect. I'm not willing to do that. I'm not brave enough to do that as a minister. I know there's quite a few that right now are brave enough to do that, and I feel sorry for them because they don't know what they're doing, and they're going to have to give an account for all of those they lead down that path. I pray that nobody on this call will follow them because if they take a portion of spirit of prophecy, especially a thus, say at the Lord portion, where an eye was shown type of thing, and they change it, then that's what they just did. They made the spirit of prophecy of none effect. So do we have in our ranks someone who testifies of Christ with the authority of the spirit of prophecy? Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You all don't know me very well, you know, as far as my past. I've shared a little bit about it. But I got involved in the theology called Shepherd's Rod. I don't know if it's over there in Norway. It's, uh, it's pretty prolific here in America, especially even among the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, because they believe that they are the Elijah prophets. And we're going to go there in a moment. But the thing about it is, is that the only thing that took me away from that error, that ultimately helped me understand, was a statement that a man made to me years ago. And it brought me out of it. He said, Bill, he said, it all really comes down to how you looked at the gift of prophecy. Do you see it as a person, an individual? Or do you see it as Jesus testifying through that individual? If you see it as Jesus testifying through that individual, then who is speaking? And I had to come to the conclusion from that line of reasoning that it would have to be Jesus speaking and not the person. The person was merely the vessel that Jesus spoke through. So then, there can only be one right. Right? I mean, that's the question that I would ask. You. There can only be one right, and you'll have to say right. And the sifting that's taking place right now really is going to divide the world into two groups. All of mankind, even within the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, even those that profess to be in the truth right now, they're being sifted as well. And those that will come out of Babylonian confusion, which has actually come in among our ranks with the Trinity and other doctrines, other errors that have come in, futurism is another one. We touched on it a little bit today. They, they did the same. They, they changed the prophecies of Daniel. This is what we have today. We call it futurism. It's a change of the prophecies of Daniel. Anytime you mess with something, that's why the Lord says, if you touch it, then I'm going to touch you, either with the plagues, or I'm going to take your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life if you remove from it. So we don't want to do that. But we all have to come out of this confusion. So 
as we begin to close, and I'm going to read something to you in closing, because how do you test a prophet? You test a prophet by their words. Do their words testify of Jesus or not? And where is my, okay, right there. Their words, do they testify of Jesus or do they not? Um, well, go with me to the last book of the Old Testament, book of Malachi. And in Malachi, chapter 4, reading in verse 4, Malachi 4.4, 4, it says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now this idea of Elijah coming, it's a figure. Because we know that it can't be literal Elijah that will come in the last days, because Elijah has gone to heaven. He's there now. He ascended up in a chariot. Okay? He's not coming back here. Because we know that when Jesus spoke of John the Baptist, he declared him as Elijah. So then, what is Elijah about in the last days? Elijah is about a message. It's about a message that will remember the law of Moses, the law of his servant Moses. The law of the servant Moses ultimately with the statutes and judgments, i.e. the Ten Commandments that were given to him on Mount Sinai, that were written on the tables of stone by the very finger of Jesus himself, and that were brought down and given to the children of Israel. And they're somewhere in this earth to this day in the Ark of the Covenant. We don't know where that is. We're told that. But it is here. And it's a testimony in the earth that God's law is binding. There has to be a people that do that at the end. They will play the role of an Elijah. And their message is going to turn the heart of children to their fathers and the heart of fathers to their children. So it's a message of, of love, which is the character of Christ. But it's also a message that calls back to the old past because, you know, it was about the time that I hit the age of 30 that I began to realize that my parents knew some things that I didn't think they knew up until that point. I began to realize there was some wisdom there. And I'm hoping that God's professed people today will see there really is some wisdom in our past and will begin to look at it instead of saying, well, you know, we, we believe in a God of the future. Well, we're told in the book of Jeremiah to seek out the old paths and walk therein, that you find rest for your souls. And if you go on to read there in Jeremiah, it says, but you would not. Therefore, they will find no rest, and actually they will be cursed. So we don't want to end up there. But the thing about it is, is this. As we think about a prophet, do they testify of Jesus? We test them by their words. So what I want to do is I want to read as I close a sermon uh, by Ellen White that she wrote, and let's just read her word, and let's see, does she testify of Jesus? And then the only thing I can say to those that may wonder if that is the gift of prophecy, if the spirit of prophecy is the gift of prophecy to us in these days, is that you have to go and read the words. You have to test it. You can't test it off of what somebody else has said. You can't test it off of how somebody has handled it, because I was told years ago, and I try to live by it, I read the writings of Ellen White for myself. I don't read them for others. I read them to, to increase my spiritual understanding and strength with Jesus. I don't read them with a the frame of reference, oh, I see that person in here. I'm looking to see, am I there? Because I need to examine my own case and make sure that I'm right with the Lord. I can't be right with the Lord for others. I cannot make others right with the Lord. That's not my responsibility. All I can do is minister the truth, and then the Spirit of Christ brings that home. So I want to read this to you, and then you think for yourselves. Is that the testimony of Jesus? Is that what Jesus would tell us? It says, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. At the beginning of the chapter from which this verse is taken, Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. To the repenting sinner, God is ever ready to show his mercy and truth. 
He is ready to bestow upon him forgiveness and love, and he requires that those who have been blessed by his compassion shall reveal the same mercy and love toward their fellow men. For this is doing the works of Christ. This is keeping the commandments of God. Those who show true gratitude glorify God by loving him supremely and their neighbors as themselves. They manifest the fact that they have received not the spirit which is of the world, but the spirit which is of God. By an experimental knowledge they know what are the good things freely given them of God, for they are illuminated by, his, by the Holy Spirit. They work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who worketh in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christ abides in the soul of the believer, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. When we look upon ourselves as the purchased possession of Christ, we shall more clearly realize our need of his constant presence in order that we may represent him by manifesting sympathy and love to all who are brought within the sphere of our influence. Our life is charged with solemn responsibilities and is only when we are fully consecrated to God, only when he cleanses us, and puts his own life and spirit upon us that we can rightly represent him to others. Our accountability extends to our thoughts, words, and acts, as well as to our larger transactions among our fellow men. In order to fulfill the law, we are to carry out the golden rule and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Our influence must be sanctified by the Spirit or by the Holy Spirit of God if it is to be a blessing to humanity. We are not to be anxious as to what we will do for weeks or months or years ahead. For the future does not belong to us. One day alone is ours, and during this day we are to live for God, beautify our characters by faith in the righteousness of Christ. This one day we are to place in the hands of Christ in solemn service, in all our purposes and plans to be guided by him. This one day we are to do unto others exactly as we wish them to do to us. We are to be ready to speak kind words from hearts full of sympathy and love. We are to manifest patience, revealing to the world what it means to be practical doers of the words of Christ, ever remembering that our life is bound up with the life of him who died for us. Christ and the child of humanity become one, so that the spirit and character of Christ are represented in his followers day by day and hour by hour. By faith, Christ becomes unto the believer righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It is not enough to talk about the straight gate, to point to the straight gate, to preach sermons about the straight gate. The only safe thing for every soul to do is enter in at the straight gate. The only safe thing for the sinner to do is to respond to the drawing of Christ's love. The road to death is broad, and the gate is wide. The whole fallen race may go in thereat with all their worldliness, all their selfishness, all their pride, dishonesty, and moral debasement. The gate is so wide, the road is so broad, that there is room for every man's opinion and doctrines, space for everyone to follow his inclinations, to do whatever his self-love would dictate. The covetous, the spendthrift, the infidel, the prolificate, the gambler, the murderer, the hypocrite, and the self-deceived, all find paths suited to their taste in which to walk. Divided in their opinions, Yet they find one point for purpose and action, for they all agree in opposing the counsel of God. There are many in the broad way who are not fully satisfied with the path in which they walk. They long to break from the slavery of sin and seek to make a stand against their sinful practices. In their own strength, they hear the warning call to repentance. They hear that the only hope of the sinner is found in Christ. They look toward the narrow way and the straight gate. But selfish pleasure, love of the world, unsanctified ambition and price place a barrier between them and the Savior. They realize that all their idols must be expelled from the soul, that every sinful indulgence must be given up. All worldly encumbrances must be laid aside. In order to enter in at the straight gate, Jesus says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. In order to walk in the narrow way, the believing one must follow the leader, turning not to the right hand or to the left. On every hand waits the enemy to present before the soul the attractions of the world. Jesus presents the attractions of the eternal world. But many who see that they cannot enter heaven and indulge themselves in this world turn away from the eternal realities and choose the broad way that leads to destruction. The Lord saw the danger incurred by his followers in mingling with the world, and he entreats them to examine themselves and see that they make no mistake as to which road they will travel. The line of demarcation between the church and the world has become sadly obliterated because many professors of religion have thought they could please themselves and meet the world's standard 
and at the same time have their names upon the church book. Even in the pulpits of the land, there are many false shepherds who cry to those who are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, peace and safety when there is no peace or safety. Jesus has given a positive warning against these false shepherds. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. In every age, false prophets have been the most dangerous enemies Christianity has had. Men have appeared who claim to be champions of truth, professing to have a great burden for the souls of their fellow men, but they taught false doctrines and perverted the truth. <clears throat> the spirit they manifested, the work they wrought, testified to the character of their religion. Such men have risen and do arise and will continue to arise to our own day. They will criticize, judge others, will be re always ready for controversy and will resist the truth. They will put false interpretations upon the scripture. They will misstate the words of those who advocate truth. And some who listen to them, who do not have spiritual discernment, will be misled by these false teachers and be found fighting under the black banner of the adversary of God and man. There are many who profess to know Christ, but in the works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and every good work reprobate. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds and without water, carried about with wind, winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. There are many who can make excellent speeches, speak smooth things, and prophesy deceit, but they are not to be received simply because of their smooth words and fair speeches. It is an easy matter to talk. The question is, what fruit do they bear into holiness? It is the fruit that testifies of the character of the tree. To say and to do not is to be as a tree full of pretentious leaves, yet barren and fruitless. The punishment that awaits the hypocrite will be unmingled with mercy. Those who profess to know Christ and in works have denied him have passed themselves off as gold, but in the sight of God they have been as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In professing faith in the gospel, the hypocrite may gain the confidence of men, but nothing short of doing the sayings of Christ will give him an entrance into the straight gate, into the way cast up for the ransom of the Lord to walk in, the only way that leads from earth to heaven. Those who profess to have light from the Lord who win the confidence of men and lead souls to ruin will bring swift destruction upon themselves. Those they are representing as that class who destroy the way of my past, saith the Lord. Where in the insignia of Christ they serve the Lord's worst enemy and heed not the injunction. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Christ plainly states that this class of teachers are as wolves in sheep's clothing. They talk of grace, they preach of grace, apparently they pray for grace, but they have not the grace of Christ in their hearts. In the pulpit, such ministers may appear to be excellent, but they destroy, the for they destroy the force of their words when out of the pulpit, by such a course of iniquity, they prove themselves to be ministers of sin, wolves in sheep's clothing. Christ came to teach us how to live. He has invited us to come to him, to learn of him, to be meek and lowly of heart, that we may find rest unto our souls. Because Jesus has lived our example, we have no excuse for not imitating his life and works. Those who profess his name and do not practice his precepts are weighed in the balances of heaven and are found wanting. Those who reflect the image of Christ will have a place in the mansions which he has gone to prepare. Jesus will reward every man according to his works. He says, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus calls upon me to judge him by his actions. He said, if I do not, my, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. He does not ask men to take him for their Savior. If they can find anything in his life and character contrary to his claims, men are to be known in the same way. For a profession of Christianity does not make a man a Christian. If his words, his deportment, his business transactions are not of a Christ-like order, he denies his profession. As Christ was in the world, so his followers are to be. The world notices every inconsistency in him who professes to be a Christian. The sun may shine day after day in pure splendor <clears throat> and call forth no remark. But let an eclipse take place, and everyone's attention is attracted to the darkened orb of the day. So it is with the Christian, for he is a spectacle unto the world, to angels, to men. Satan is constantly on the alert to cause the Christian to stumble, that he may point the world to the inconsistency of the follower of Christ. 
Men may, have, men may not have observed you in your consistency, but in your waywardness, in your unchristlikeness of character, how the world subjects you to criticism, how Satan delights to taunt the ministering angels unseen by human eyes by, present, by presenting the inconsistent Christian in all his deformity before them, by pointing to the garment spotted with the flesh, for to Satan this is an occasion of triumph. Then let us walk carefully and prayerfully before the Lord, knowing that the world will judge us by our fruits. All I can say as I close is I don't know of any one in my whole life that I have ever read that speaks that way that I just read to you. And all you can do is judge it by its fruit. If you spend time in it, you will find that it will change you. It has changed me. And that is the greatest testimony that I can give that Ellen White was given the gift of prophecy and that Jesus Christ did indeed speak directly through her by the pen that we can read from today. And I believe what I just read to you is a very clear testimony that indeed Jesus Christ was working with that woman. Because I don't know of any minister that I have ever heard preach a sermon that was less than 14 minutes that was so powerful and profound than what I just read to you just now. And I find that consistently to be the case as I read the white writings of Ellen White. Like I said, I could go into all kinds of other reasons why you should accept her as a prophet, but you test a prophet by their words. And do their words tend to eternal life, or do they tend to damnation? And I have found consistently that the words that I read in the spirit of prophecy, i.e., we call it the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus through Ellen White, to be upward and toward heaven, not downward. I've never found them to be downward. i found them at times to be difficult to understand what she might be referring to. And we can testify to that because those of us in the Father-Son message have found there's sometimes statements there that they have tried to use against us to say, see, she believed the Trinity. There are some examples of that in her writings. But consistently, I have found that her writings tend upward. I've never found them to tend downward. And so... That would be my discourse today on spirit of prophecy, maybe a little bit different than what you expected. But we have to understand that in these last days, the devil is doing everything that he can to deceive. And Revelation 16 has told us that he will be doing it by the spirits of frogs, three frogs, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, paganism, the papacy, and apostate Protestantism. By and large, those of us that would identify ourselves with the Sabbath would reject paganism and would reject the papacy. But in many ways, we are still being influenced by apostate Protestantism. And apostate Protestantism rejects the spirit of prophecy as found in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. They reject the Sabbath. To me, there is no safety there because the true people of God will have the testimony of Jesus Christ and they will keep the commandments of God. They have both. And there's only one person I know within that movement that has claimed to have the gift of prophecy, and that is Ellen White. And I've never read anything like it in my life, and I think anyone who is in question of it on this call today or is wondering, just go read. Just go read. That was the declaration that they gave of Jesus when they came back and said, well, what do you say of him? And they, all they could say was, never man spake like that, man. Never heard anybody talk like that. You want to say that he's a false prophet? Did you hear what he has to say? Have you heard his words? He said the same thing, the blind man. who was born blind from his birth, and Jesus opened his eyes. He said, this man is a devil. And what did he say back to them? He said, I don't know if I've ever heard of any man that had a devil that opened the eyes of a man that was born blind. I don't even know of anyone that was ever born blind that received his sight. I don't know what you're talking about. And that's the same thing I would say today to those that would question the gifting and spirit of prophecy as identified in Ellen White. If you haven't read her words, then you're not going to know. If you refuse to read your, her words, you'll never know. But if you take time to spend some time there, I believe you'll come away with the testimony that I have and others have that indeed Jesus Christ has spoken by the pen of inspiration. So with that, I'll close in prayer and, and uh, open it up. I don't know if I need to open it up for questions. I, I uh, got, got, actually got to get ready. I got to preach two more times today. Uh, I would ask that you all please pray for me. Uh, we're going to be doing evangelistic meetings in South Carolina uh, next week for five days, and we're going to be seeking to go after those that are in the world, not just those within our ranks, 
but those that are in the world now. Uh, we need to try, to try to take it to the world. And I just pray for grace to do that. I'm going to endeavor to preach this chart behind me here. This chart, which is a part of our history, that's the 1863 chart. But that's our prophetic message, and we need to understand that too. Perhaps we can talk more about that another time. But I'm going to close with prayer now. Father, I just come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you just so much for your love to us. I thank you that as your children here upon the earth, that are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The devil would do all that he can to deceive because he knows his time is short. You have given us a lighthouse, a beacon of light, a beacon of truth that is convicting, and it will challenge us as those that profess to be Christians because the standard is high, and the mark that we must meet here in the last days is great because we are to be a witness to the world that is lies in sin, that lies in deception. And I just pray that those that are on the call this morning will heed the call to come up higher. If there be any sin in our lives that would beset us, that would keep us from you, that we would put it away today, if we will hear your voice, is the day to repent. And those that truly are called by your name believe that you are able to save to the uttermost, Jesus. And I believe you can save me. I believe you can take away every sin that besets me. And I pray that those on this call, they would believe the same. Help our unbelief. We believe, but help our unbelief. All that will pray this way cannot be lost. And I thank you so much for your love and mercy to us. I pray all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.